Hey, welcome back to Global Environment. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the global heat engine. And to start that out, I'm going to show you a little bit of a paradox. Okay. Now, let's, let's take mercury, for example. Mercury very close to the sun. And as you'd expect, the side that faces the sun is really, really hot. Right here it says 350 degrees Celsius. But on the night side, it's really, really cold, 180 degrees Celsius, minus 180 degrees Celsius. So huge, huge difference. But if we look at the Earth, and here, you know, here's a map, and it's, it's got basic temperatures, average temperatures over the surface, there really isn't a huge difference. And there's not a huge difference between night and day. Now, why is that? What is the big difference between Mercury and the Earth? Well, this might give you a clue if you look at this picture. All right, so, so maybe you're thinking, well, there, there, there's clouds and there's the ocean. Yeah, we, the, the, the answer is we have an atmosphere. We have an atmosphere, and that makes a big difference on how energy moves around on the surface. It actually helps it move around on the surface. So if we look back at this picture, what do you see here? You see wispy clouds. And this, this is uh, kind of demonstrating to you the currents of the wind. So wind moves energy around the Earth. And also we have currents in the water, and we have water that's soaking up energy. And what's going on is there's a huge heat engine on the Earth that moves heat around. And it has a lot to do with environmental science, and we'll talk about that more in a sec. Okay. Now look at this. What, what is the end result of this global heat engine? One is that we have climate patterns. And if you look at this map here, you see different colors representing different cli climate patterns. And you can see that there's all different types. These graphs here show temperature variation, so average temperatures. You also have rain patterns here. And you see all different variations all over the Earth. And if you look at this map, to a large extent, they go along the latitudes, you know, the same latitude. There's some variation. We're going to go into why does that occur. And you're going to, you're going to actually try to apply some of the knowledge from your readings to figure these out. Okay, first of all, we've got to step back and, and look at energy because energy is the, 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 key, the key driver for what we see here. And you have to understand the concept of a photon flux. So, the, the sun is giving off energy, and it comes to the Earth roughly uh, in, in parallel lines. Um, and the photon flux, as you can see, and the solar constant is at you know, approximate you know, 1.3969 kilowatt uh, kilowatts per meter squared. So that's our solar constant. So it comes in, but what it's coming in contact with is a curved Earth, a curved Earth. And things result from that. And you can see why when we look at solar radiation coming in, we'll, we'll put it in boxes, if it hits near the equator, basically the, the photon flux is about the same. But as we go toward the poles, now because of that curvature, that energy is spread out. So you can imagine that the energy is more concentrated, less concentrated here, so it is warmer here because that energy turns into heat energy. Some of it's reflected and reflect, refracted, but a lot of it turns into heat energy. So now we have a gradient, a gradient of light and a gradient of heat on the Earth, and that drives the global heat engine. Okay, let, let's see what else happens. So here's, here's a, a graph that shows the intensity of radiation coming in, right here, and this is uh, where we are on the globe, uh, our latitude, and you can see incoming radiation, it's very high near the equator, and then it progressively decreases. But look at this part of the graph here, this dashed line. The outgoing radiation is, is somewhat different. It's lower than incoming, because it's turning to heat, you expect some to radiate out, and then it kind of goes down, but much more slowly. So when we look at the poles, now there's a big difference. Outgoing is greater than in, uh, incoming. Now that, that's a problem here because let, let's take the equator. If there's more radiation coming in than going out, what should happen? It should just keep heating up. 
and the kind of the opposite effect here and that's not what's going on it's it's stable it's fairly stable the temperature so how can that be well the answer is is that the energy the heat energy is being moved and you can see that in this graph this is the northward heat transport that we see on the earth for latitude and you can see where it says total this is the amount of heat that's being moved now how is it being moved one way it's being moved is by the atmosphere those winds we looked at when we were looking at the globe you can see that that moves a lot of heat northward but also the oceans and we again we get the sum right here so there's that global heat engine moving energy around the planet and it moves other things too and that's important okay so we're we're setting the abiotic environment up we're setting it up with the global heat engine uh, and and you know why are we doing that because the abiotic environment impacts the biotic environment. We're going to talk a lot about the biotic environment later in the course, and this is, this is a driver. The other thing is we're going to talk about biogeochemical cycles, like how does nitrogen move through, um, the, move through the Earth's systems? How does carbon move? This, this global heat engine helps to drive biogeochemical cycles. Also, when we're talking about other materials, these materials can be moved. What am I talking about? For example, you can find DDT in the tissues of penguins. Well, how did it get there? Did we spray it down there? No, we didn't spray it down there. The global heat engine helps to bring it down there. Okay, now what do I have here in front of me? I have here in front of me an imaginary continent, and you will be creating imaginary continents as part of your final project in this course. And what, what, what are we going to do with these imaginary continents? One of the things we're going to do is once we create them, we are going to look at them and see and try to determine how do the winds blow? What are the energy gradients? What are the temperature gradients? Um, what are the environments that come out of this? So you have directions in your online course of, on how to produce one of these continents and I want you to do that and we're going to work to put the winds on it. The winds, the moisture gradients, and the temperature gradients. And just to give you an idea, you know, here, here's, here's another example of a continent we could use. And, and something to point out is these imaginary continents here spin, uh, the, the planet spins in the opposite direction of the earth. So I want you to work on these. I want you to find out how the winds blow, the temperature gradients, and also the moisture gradients and I'm gonna you're gonna be able to tap into some some hint type clips that I'm gonna produce and they'll be underneath this clip if you get stuck but try to do it without looking at the clips first and then if you get stuck look at the clips so um, I'll see you next time at least on the clips so have a good day